Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar session from the Maternal Health Learning and Innovation Center. We appreciate you joining us this afternoon. My name is Alice Pollard, and I'm the training coordinator with the Maternal Health Learning and Innovation Center. The Maternal Health Learning and Innovation Center is a new national resource center developed to accelerate innovative and evidence-informed interventions that improve maternal health and eliminate maternal health inequities. The center has many different collaborating groups, and we're very excited to be able to bring you this webinar today. Um, I'm going to just go over a couple of housekeeping items and an introduction to get everybody oriented to the space, but we'll spend most of our time with our presenters today. So as many of you know, this month we have organized several virtual opportunities to talk more with maternal health advocates about telehealth. And the first two webinars in our series, um, the one today and then one next week, um, we are going to be talking with healthcare providers and advocates who have incorporated telehealth into maternal health care. Um, and the audience today is made up of a lot of different folks. We have maternal health advocates from across the country who are joining us today. Many of them are the HRSA-funded state maternal health innovation programs and the Our Moms team. So a special welcome to you all. Um, some of our objectives for this telehealth series are for you all to understand how other programs have incorporated telehealth into maternal care and to take away some ideas for your own states and regions. So today on the webinar, we're very excited to feature the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Just a few housekeeping reminders. Um, we will be recording today's webinar and we will be making it available shortly after the session ends. All participants are muted, but that doesn't mean that we don't want to hear from you. We will have time for a question and answer at the end of the presentation. So please use the question and answer box on your Zoom panel to enter in any questions that you have. We will also have a short evaluation survey for participants that you will see on a link in the slides and in the chat at the end of the webinar. So we invite your feedback. Um, one note, the Maternal Health Learning and Innovation Center is very um, excited and thankful to have funding from the Health Resources and Services Administration, and the information or content and conclusions of this presentation are those of the presenter and should not be construed as the official position or policy of HRSA, HHS, or the U.S. government. Um, so I'm going to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Curtis Lowry. Um, who is also joined by a couple of his colleagues today. Um, Dr. Lowry is director of the University of Arkansas um, for the Medical Sciences Institute for Digital Health and Innovation, and he serves as the professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Over the past 20 years, he has facilitated the process for Arkansas Medicaid and other insurers to reimburse for telemedicine care by promoting the understanding of digital health and its benefits to rural health care access. Um, he also has an interest we were just learning about in space travel, so a lot of different um, experience and um, knowledge that Dr. Lowry brings to the presentation today, and we're just so excited to have him here. He's also joined by his colleague, Rosalind Perkins, who's a woman's health nurse practitioner, um, who may jump in at, at specific points as well. So we really appreciate your time. And I wanted to give a special thank you as well to the South Central Telehealth Resource Center, who helped to facilitate um, the presentation today. So thank you all so much for your um, participation. And I'm going to stop sharing. So Dr. Lowry, you can uh, take control of the screen and share your presentation. And then I'll turn I, it over I really, to you. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> you know, as you can see, I, I grew up in the, well, I was young in the 60s during the, the peak of NASA and the Apollo program where President Kenny said we're going to put a, a person on the moon by the end of the decade. And despite President Kennedy being assassinated, America did that. And I would, I would point out that probably um, NASA is one of the biggest developers of, of telemedicine. You know, the astronauts all had monitoring capabilities, and we saw videos from the moon and from, you know, the space capsules during this period of time. So it's kind of maybe the first approach to digital health and telemedicine back in in those early days. And so it very much had a, an influence on the way I looked at things and the way I thought about life in general. Um, and so I think that 
you know, if you approach things in the right way, then technology can become, you know, your friend. And if you use it the right way, you can solve problems with it. Um, if, if not used appropriately, it's just a waste of time and money. So I think it's, I took it upon myself to understand technology as a physician to be able to apply it in the, in the right way. And that's the way we sort of began in Arkansas many years back. Um, and so these are two companies that we started over the years. Um, Angel Eye is still available in nurseries and, you know, it's a camera that, that's put on the bassinet and the family members can watch the premature infants in the, the uh, uh, bassinet um, family members. So, um, okay, uh, uh, participants will learn how to design and implement telehealth platform and why that's important. And, you know, it, when you're doing uh, telemedicine, the biggest breakthrough in this, I mean, there's direct to consumer or direct to patient one way between a doctor, but a lot of the power comes from the use of subspecialists that then can work with local practitioners, whether they're family medicine, APRNs, or um, family medicine, um, or other OBGYN guys to support and provide care in underserved areas. So, um, and the participants will learn, um, um, move this out of the way, um, will learn why it's important to continue to uh, deliver care under this uh, uh, model and support the traditional model. So the idea is not to take patients away from the rural areas, but to support the practitioners in the delivery of care. And so uh, this is a slide by Ezekiel J. Manuel, who wrote, for, wrote a New York Times op piece in 2018 and said, our hospitals becoming obsolete. So what year did we see the most maximum number of hospitalizations in the US? Um, and so the answer to that is 1981, in which we had 171 admissions per 1,000 Americans. And since that time, it's been dropping, mainly because we've been doing a lot more in the inpatient, outpatient, and we're doing, you know, remote patient monitoring, and we're sort of moving things out of an intensive environment into a less intensive, uh, intensive environment. There's now a lower rate of hospitalizations than we had in 1946, where everybody went to kind of die in the hospitals. Um, and the total number of hospitals have declined uh, from uh, high in 2017 of 6933, 2018, 5,534. Some of this is due to rural hospital closings, but also due to consolidation and just the reduction in the total number of beds needed. And so um, th this is the battle of the giants. Um, and I, I want you to think about it as a concept. And Walmart is uh, basically brick and mortar around the nation started as brick and mortar. It's, of course, Walmart is, uh, origin is in um, Arkansas, up in the Fayetteville area, is where the headquarters um, is located. And then Amazon is uh, totally a digital platform in that, you know, it's been digital, started with books, and then they started selling other things. And so both of them are evolving. So we're uh, in healthcare, traditional healthcare, we're very much like Walmart, where we have brick and mortar. You know, we have our hospitals and clinics, et cetera. And Teladoc and other national companies are very much the digital platform. The truth lies somewhere between these two extremes in that, you know, Walmart is becoming more digital, and just like we're going to have to become more digital. And um, Amazon is now having to buy uh, brick and mortar stores like Whole Foods because you can't you know, you can't order your food from California and have it right, your lettuce have it right the next day. So they need to be nearer to the consumers. And it's not really sure who's gonna win in this model, whether it's gonna be Walmart, because they do have the last mile. <clears throat> As they become more digital, this may provide an advantage for them. And you know, one doesn't have to be a genius to look at how this is, the world is changing around us. So this is the banking industry. And if you remember the banking industry was a bunch of uh, banks, many of which were mom and pop sort of banks. And now the, this has evolved um, to be large banks got bought by smaller banks and they've gotten bigger and bigger. 
And then we begin to see these teller machines on the side of the street. And this, these were uh, really good because uh, they were at nighttime and weekends of which the traditional banks were closed. And of course, now this has evolved to the point of, you know, you do your banking on your computer and your cell phone, and you don't even have to go to the bank very, very often. And, you know, hospitals have sort of gone through the same model in which smaller um, hospitals got bought by bigger and they got bigger and bigger. And then we started seeing these uh, neighborhood clinics, you know, urgent care clinics on the side of the road. And then, of course, Teladoc and other companies came along. And now you can get your health care via your cell phone. And many young people are, in fact, doing that and they don't have doctors anymore. Um, now, so this is about maternal health, and I'm going to talk about the, mainly the ANGELS program, which had the origin in the 90s, really, uh, early 90s, um, in which we started doing education and then started providing care using a uh, telemedicine platform. And we all know that mothers should not die, and we're all aware of the fact that U.S. has a higher maternal mortality rate than in other countries. Uh, other countries, other uh, developed countries. And so this is maternal mortality in the U.S. Many people are aware of this curve in which we've actually gone up, whereas the other industrialized nations saw a drop in maternal death rates over the years. This has been argued as to why this might have happened. There have been a lot of reasons, you know, from C-sections to problems in um, poverty and public health and closing of rural hospitals, but forever, whatever the reason, this is a, a, a true statement. So, and, and this is the worst and be, uh, best states around the nation. You can see that um, District of Columbia has the highest maternal mortality in the nation, which is interesting since there's a lot of hospitals in the District of Columbia. And then Mississippi and Arkansas, we all have unacceptably high maternal mortality rates in Massachusetts has the lowest maternal mortality rate. And um, maternal mortality is one thing and it's tragic and horrible, but remember that for every death, there's somewhere between 50 and, a, and 100 women that don't die, but may have long-term morbidity, you know, including, you know, um, strokes and endocrine disorders and other deficits that, that go on much beyond the, the emergent event that happens to the mother during pregnancy. So it's a, it's a tragic thing that we must do something about. And so um, one of the arguments, like I said, for this is rural maternity services have been in jeopardy. And so um, despite the fact um, uh, only about 20% of women live in rural areas, this represent, the, the death rate represents somewhere between 30 and 40% of all deaths occur in rural areas. Uh, half a million uh, women live in rural uh, U.S. and the majority rely on local maternity services, particularly when they have transportation uh, uh, problems, which most, many women in rural areas are poor and often have transportation problems. And so 10% of rural uh, counties lost their, their hospitals and clinics in the last 10 years. And when this happens, there's a doubling of infant mortality rates in counties that have lost the obstetrical services. And so the distance to obstetrical hospitals um, has been increasing with rural hospital closure. Studies have linked drives of greater than 45 minutes to adverse outcomes um, and temporary housing locations are expensive in, in urban areas. So um, a way to get around this, of course, would be for women to move to urban areas near the end of their pregnancy so they can be near a delivering hospital. And women of wealth can do that, but poor women cannot afford to do that. And the distance delivery is associated with family stress. So if the mothers do move away from home or if they're delivering in a hospital, you know, hours away from their home, this creates stress on the family. And it may be associated in a, with a reduction in prenatal care because if the hospital uh, stops doing obstetrics, 
often the providers will leave and so there's not someone around that could even provide prenatal care unless it could be picked up by the health departments. And so you can see this is a map of maternity deserts around the U.S. and you can see that on the east coast and west coast there's less of a deficit but when we move in the middle of the country and more so even in the south there's um, lesser access to uh, prenatal care and obstetrical services. And uh, telemedicine uh, uh, reimbursement um, helps deal with some of these issues. Um, if, if you can get paid for telemedicine, then um, people do more of this. Now, um, in the last um, you know, four months, telemedicine has jumped from uh, five years into the future, mainly because with COVID, um, it was required that um, telemedicine be paid for. Um, which meant that, that uh, pract practitioner subspecialists and other groups could get paid for a telemedicine visit and before it was a struggle to get paid. And so as a result of that, um, there's support for local practitioners. The patients can stay local and be supported by an expert rural community, retains the revenue, and they're reimbursed now by private health insurers Medicare and uh, Medicaid. Of course, in obstetrics, we're not talking about Medicaid, but uh, in most cases. But so with payment, the probability of this expanding. In Arkansas, we got around this because we um, negotiated a contract with Medicaid to pay our subspecialists, our maternal fetal medicine and general OBGYN guys to provide care in these rural areas. So we've been doing it since uh, 2003, which I'll talk a little bit later. And so um, the Arkansas solution, you know, the Albert Einstein Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So um, if you think you're going to solve the problem in maternal care by training more practitioners and getting, getting them to go to the rural area, this is highly unlikely. Even if you train people, the, getting them to practice in rural areas is really problematic, particularly when you're talking about OBGYN and, and maternal fetal medicine specialists for which they need population and they need um, hospitals capable of providing revenue resources to offset their large salaries. But uh, working, having subspecialists working with, with primary care, family medicine, APRNs, and other groups is a possible solution to some of these problems. And, and our vision in Arkansas was to eliminate healthcare disparities um, and abroad, abroad through digital health and healthcare innovations, which embrace technology that improves access to and the quality of clinical care education and research. So a big part of care in rural areas is that the primary care providers often lose touch with changes in, in healthcare. So a big part of what we do is educate providers and also they should be including in research projects just like people in urban areas, which is rarely the case with uh, research. And when we formed the Institute for Digital Healthcare and Healthcare Innovation last year, I mean, we, we included academic education and uh, clinical training for the providers and access to research. And uh, we are, I'm on a AAMC committee for training competencies, um, which we're developing for telemedicine now. So these things, these competencies would be um, made available and in, in uh, medical, nursing, other groups, these competencies will be uh, the, the platform or the model for which we would be training the workforce of the future to do telemedicine and use digital health as part of their practice. Um, and so we're doing that now at UAMS. We have a senior elected and uh, we're starting an honor, honors program. And so that the medical school students will expose this. And we're also working with nursing and pharmacy. And in clinical training, we've developed um, uh, videos and other techniques for training, you know, faculty, nursing services, and other groups and their online modules, which they can go in and, and other uh, of the uh, CTSAs, uh, so, sorry, of the um, telemedicine resource centers around the nation 
have also produced modules. And so these are readily available to groups around the nation to help in the training of providers. And, you know, IPE is a big part of this. And if, in fact, I think is the most powerful part of using digital health in which that we, we do need to have practitioners in underserved areas and we need to work with them so that the, everybody gets the same access to quality care. And so, um, of course, there'll never be online deliveries. No one will ever deliver a baby online, although I can watch a delivery and insist someone that's having trouble with the delivery. Um, <clears throat> Whit Hall, one of the neonatologists working at UAMS, has um, developed a, a, a video laryngoscope that he can watch uh, less experienced practitioners intubate babies, you know, remotely <clears throat> at the university. So the opportunity for things like this exists, you know, certainly running ICUs, resuscitating mothers in a postpartum hemorrhage and hypertensive crisis are all possibilities of online activities in the acute phase. So we're talking about a virtual hospital, digital health, maximizes health care resources so that um, a subspecialist can now be um, made available across different hospitals so they can be shared. Um, we're doing that with some hospitals in Arkansas now. Provides increased opportunity to engage um, primary care clinicians and other, other non-MD clinicians. And it um, goes directly to the patient and helps them in self-managing their care. So the patient actually becomes the end point of many of these interventions with the remote patient monitoring and engagement in the home of the patient so that they're essentially being treated 24 seven in these environments. And it uses technology available to consumers to deliver patient care outside of the hospital or the doctor's office. It links the patients, doctor, doctors and hospitals in a system of care. And I wanna focus on system here we're talking about building these integrated, continuous systems of care, and it's delivered anywhere, anytime, and by anyone, so that we identify problems earlier in the process, and then go to the home or go to the patient and do things to keep them from deteriorating. Okay, so healthcare experts um, that say that economic experts say there's a broad consensus that fee for service reimbursement distorts care provision away from social optimum and incentivizes and encourages over treatment. So <clears throat> if I get paid for an activity, I want to do as much of that activity as I possibly can. And I don't want to waste my time doing things that I don't get paid for. And that's the sad situation of healthcare in America today. And so if you look at identified waste in healthcare on this slide, you can see that there's a lot of waste, variation in the intensity of medical and surgical service, at least 600 billion, misuse of drugs and treatments, 52 billion, ED overuse, at least 55 billion, and underused controller meds such as asthma medication and other drugs, uh, 2.5 billion, and failure to use cheaper general medications, more than 3 billion, and antibiotic overuse, 1.1 billion. So there's at least 30%, probably more, of health care is wasted at present. So there's opportunity to reduce some of this waste and the process um, be paid in a different way in a value-based approach. In a fee-for-service world, there's reduction in payment. If you reduce payment, which is what we're seeing right now in America, we're seeing less pay for pro fees for the doctors and less payment for DRG in an attempt to reduce spending in healthcare. But this may result in uh, doctors and systems trying to see more patients. If you make less per patient, if you can see a lot more patients, you can maintain your profit, your margin, by just running patients through the system. Patients are really frustrated with that and they're angry and they're uh, gonna see, pro we're gonna see problems with missing you know, problems in, in delivery just by increasing the volume that we're seeing. If you think about this, you know, the death of fee-for-service, um, Walmart wants let, to pay less money 
for healthcare delivery. And so they put pressure on insurance companies to reduce their, their um, payment. And so there's um, increasing number uh, of procedures, decreased fees. So what do you do? You increase the number of fees. And because of that, um, the insurance companies say we need to pay less per fee. And so they further decrease fees, further volume increases to make up for this. Layoffs of personnel, uh, layoff of personnel and cuts in hospitals to decrease production costs, which again can affect margin. And as we increase volume, there's physician burnout and safety issues by us all trying to adapt with, um, to the, the fee-for-service reduction. And so <clears throat> no matter how much profit, so this is a map of the ocean, and there's a bottom to the ocean no matter what, uh, near the, uh, uh, the mid-ocean uh, ridge and the trench, it's deeper than at the shoreline, but there's a bottom. And so while we lose, <clears throat> we lose our profitability in the narrow, th in the near the shoreline very easily, if you think of the water as our profit and the bottom as our uh, production costs, then you, you will get hit the bottom no matter what eventually. It may take longer to be on the bottom in the deepest part of the ocean, let's say hips and knees or other high, high cost, high profit procedures, but you eventually reach that. We try, to, we try to shift, if we lose money on some procedures, we say, yeah, but we're making a lot of money off of hips and knees, so let's just do more hips and knees, but you can't win. Ultimately, you're gonna lose in this. So really what we need to be thinking about is systems engineering. So systems engineering integrates all disciplines and subspecialty groups into a team effort, forming a structured development process that proceeds from concept to production to operation. Systems engineering considers both the business and the technical needs of all the consumers with the goal of providing a quality product that meets the user's needs. And so I think the promise of technology is that we can begin to focus on the patient as an individual and we can begin to meet their, their needs by going away from fee-for-service and building systems approaches where we negotiate contracts to deliver care. ANGELS um, stands for Antenatal Needle, Needle Guidelines Education and Learning uh, System. And we started this many years back with a concept that we're gonna uh, address healthcare problems and you know, like um, in high risk OB, it was uh, uh, how do patients get access to ultrasounds? And so we said, well, can we use technology, in this case, video conferencing, to put video conferencing lines onto ultrasound machines and then have a 24 hour call center to schedule patients, use evidence based guidelines, do case management, we can access new evolving technologies to this and then subspecialists would be available to provide the care in the rural areas and other hospitals around the nation and technology and ac academic training. And we negotiated contracts that paid for angels rather than being fixed to fee for service. So in many ways, we didn't care if the patient came to the university or not. We were optimizing the performance and doing what was right for the patient and it didn't matter if all of them delivered at the university. So we are freed from the uh, fee-for-service world by this approach. In the old days, each practitioner <clears throat> practiced on their own, separated, and they only did what they were trained to do. And um, this creates um, a siloed world for which there's often duplication, there's poor communication, now with technology, we're moving into a systems approach with multidisciplinary uh, groups that work together, MDs, physician assistants, pharmacists, APRNs, nurses, paramedics, nursing assistants, and lay community healthcare workers working in teams to optimize the performance of the uh, patient and the patient outcomes. And um, let's see, I need to say, oh. Actually, let me do that. Um, okay, so this is Medicare spending versus quality of care. 
And down, down here on the bottom is the overall quality of care. And this is spending on the left-hand axis. You can see Wisconsin had the highest overall uh, quality and spending ratio. And here's, of course, Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana, who's spending a um, pretty good bit of money and the quality's uh, less. So there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship with spending and outcome. Um, if that were true, then, you know, all the quality would be up in the upper um, um, right-hand corner of this graph. And there is a healthcare disparity around uh, the nation. And, but we believe that where you live should not determine whether you live or die. And we've been doing this high-risk OB program since, uh, for 17 years. And so, again, uh, digital health consists of traditional telehealth consults, but it's not limited. It's remote patient care, devices on patients. We just got a FCC grant to put remote monitoring patients on pregnant patients to keep them out of the doctor's office during the COVID crisis. It's around $900,000. And then, of course, apps and cell phones are part of what we do. Individual and population-based healthcare interventions that, that intervene and do things earlier on the patients. And patient reform will force this market forward. As we begin to lose money on traditional model of fee-for-service, then we want to negotiate contracts and which will use technology to provide care in a new way. And digital health maximizes healthcare resources, provide increased opportunity to gauge clinicians and patients for self-monitoring in their care delivery and delivers patient care outside of the hospital or doctor's office in this new model. I may be able to take care of you and never see you ever in your pregnancy. And so, um, Sorry, that slide should have eliminated. And so um, as a result of this evolution over time, we um, uh, got $102 million in 2010 to build this massive network around the state of Arkansas in which we uh, have put in T1 lines and other systems. And so this is our state here with the connectivity and state's only academic medical center has uh, access to thousands of millions of fiber and optic cable through this broadband network. And we've added to this a direct -to consumer platform in which now we can do care out of this network directly to cell phones. And the Institute for Digital Healthcare Innovations uh, was formed out of our vision over the years. Um, and we convinced the institution to support this concept last year. And the benefit for this uh, is research care model design and pathways workforce retooling and the new care team in which we use patients, doctors, remote workers, and machines, balance of human touch and technology, and population assessment and care delivery. And the value of this is ac improved access, improved quality, more efficient, and now experienced practitioners can provide care anywhere, anytime across the platform. And so how does it work? You know, I, I think about biology and this uh, branching tree-like system is everywhere in nature. It's root systems, it's computer networks, it's your lungs, it's your kidneys. And, you know, it optimizes in, uh, the um, surface area to the environment. You know, so by doing this, you get maximum number of leaves at the top of the tree to provide exposure for sunlight. So um, the, um, in the ANGELS program, um, in 2002, we started through a DHS contract um, in Arkansas to provide high-risk OB support. And this program was able to leverage federal dollars to increase access to care. And in this program, we provide the match to Medicaid, and then we pull down federal funds, which pays for the operation of the program. This shows again the, uh, the beginning in 2003, actually started many years prior to this, but this is the first time we got Medicaid funding to do this and evolved over time by in a play, plug and play model in which we added telenursery, stroke program, and HIV and, and sickle cell and other, other things, but it all copied the same model that we started with high risk OB. And you know, um, 
it's about providing access um, and change how, how, where, when people get health care, redesign care models using both physical and virtual space, extend reach and Im impact of clinical care without new facilities. You know, it doesn't require additional building. You know, building is a dead thing now. We shouldn't be doing that. We should be building virtual systems um, and cover gaps in healthcare coverage. There'll be less people in the hospitals than there are today. So if you're undertaking a building program, you're going in the wrong direction. The front door to digital enabled system of care, potential uh, patients around the state of Arkansas, the need integrated access center, digital front door, and a remote patient experience. And so evolution, it is not the strongest of species. Darwin said this, is not the strongest species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is most adaptable change that makes it. So you have to think like this, what's the future gonna be and how can we evolve to do that? And one thing I will, I will bet any amount of money that we're not gonna get paid more money per procedure in the future. We're gonna get paid less money for procedure in the future as price is driven down. So don't build your healthcare system on getting paid more. And so this is uh, UAMS and this is Arkansas E-Link and Learn Telehealth. And these, this is uh, you know, the um, program at UMS. So I'm finished, that's the last slide. I can show this video maybe. We'll see how it goes, if it works or not, so. Angels is really a, a new concept in healthcare delivery. The concept is that you don't have to be face to face with a patient to deliver a healthcare. Why don't we send her to the end? My doctor in my previous one, we have some from the brain of the baby. In Arkansas, we're very in the of a few large cities, and the healthcare is dramatically different from urban versus rural areas. Because they can spice our food. Well, we have people that are poor and they don't have good transportation, so it's impossible for them to travel these long distances. So, yeah, that's fine. They may be a heart rate from normal life, and, and we can see the full pain of the heart rate. With this technology, we can virtually go visit these patients and provide the care that they need. We are establishing virtual patient visits using the system. We're doing virtual consults around the state, and we're doing virtual education to all points of our state. And it's going to vary with the great council to talk to you about that. What that means. But it's not necessarily anything critical, right? It's just a result of this. And that's because it's happening. And there's some people who kind of roll that one. Without this technology, I don't know how I would have made it shorter. I can see Dr. Lowry. There's no way I could afford to take a day off to drive the three to four hours it would have taken. Those look for other markers of Down syndrome, please. My baby needs this for her health. I need this from, to ease my stress level. This technology allows us to be That's just stay on the nursery. That, I'll, I'll quit there and then uh, we can answer questions. Thank Hello? you so hi, thank you so much, Dr. Lowry. That is really helpful. Um, so I am getting a note from folks that it looks like the the chat was disabled. So you can use the QA function there that should be in the same place where you get the chat to to send in any questions. Um, um QA, okay, yeah. But and I'll read some out for you, Dr. Lowry. So um Somebody asked, what challenges have you encountered in implementing the program and how have you overcome them? implementing the ANGELS program? Yeah, well, uh, you know, getting people to use technology was early on was a problem, but we, we had teams that could train individuals. We supported it 24 seven, you know, with, with uh, both uh, tech people as well as nurses and other groups. And we'd have the nurses go and train other provide, you know, providers, MDs, and uh, other nurses to use it. You have to make it idiot-proof. I'd say in general, technology is becoming more and more idiot-proof than in the early days when it was more bulky and difficult 
to use, but now pretty much anybody can use their cell phone and do video sort of things. Doctors have uh, been more resistant to doing this than other groups, but you know, with COVID, everything just jumped forward because people that never really wanted to do it all of a sudden, you know, forced to do it during this period of time, and it'll never go back to the way it way it was. Funding has been an issue because um, insurance companies were always afraid of paying for this. They thought it was going to be Pandora's box and they couldn't afford it. But now again with COVID, they're paying for it in ways that they never thought they ever would before. So I think we're going to move forward and then we'll just have to figure out how the most appropriate use to use the technology in new ways. Great, thank you. Um, and I see uh, Rosalind Perkins is on, who is a, a colleague of Dr. Lowry. So please chime in if you have anything else to add to about sort of any challenges that you've overcome in the ANGELS program. Yeah, I think Dr. Lowry mentioned most of all of them. Uh, what I remember a lot of, like you say, we could go out and teach people, uh, but getting them to jump on board, you had to assure them that you were not there to take their patients. You only wanted to help manage those patients. So, that was a big deal. And, and now, there was a uh, question about broadband that I saw. Bro broadband is still a problem, but um, you know most hospitals have access to T1 lines around, even even in rural areas, and libraries have it, and and you know people's homes don't have access to broadband. But a lot of this technology is evolving to the point where we can do some of it by cell phone. And there are still holes in, in networks, and certainly in Arkansas and and other and other states, everybody has um, poor cell co cell phone coverage in certain areas. But it's a lot easier to drive to the top of a hill than it is to drive three hours to a provider. So um, th this continues to be a problem. I think the government is investing heavily in deploying broadband now mainly because of um, school children getting education and also economic development in the rural areas. Everybody believes this is a very important part of this. So I think you can continue to see, you know, millions, billions of dollars invested in, in broadband. We're involved in some projects here in Arkansas to help deliver broadband due to our experience. And so they're just really trying to get it out. It's almost like electricity. You know, it's almost as important as electricity. Right. Um, and what advice would you give to those who are interested in implementing perinatal telemedicine now who may just be starting programs? <laughs> well, you gotta find places that really want it. I mean, I would go, I would look at areas for which you're getting a referral of a lot of patients. You know, like where where are you, where are the patients coming from, and try to work with those groups, and you you it seems almost counterintuitive that you would do that because it would decrease the referrals, but it actually doesn't. We we have more patients now than we did before because what happened is it built a network that increased our referral, and we never tried to take the patients away from the doctors unless it was absolutely necessary to do. So you, you basically start selling your intellectual property in a way you could never do it before. And it's much better than traveling on the road. So if you're traveling to do clinics anywhere, stop it, you know, try to do it digitally, you know, because you're wasting a lot of time doing that. And it's not necessary and high risk OB to do that. We don't do that many procedures. I mean, you know, really, pubs was one of the few things that we did before, and we're not even doing that very much anymore. So all this stuff can be done, you know, via video conferencing. Great. And do you have any advice for um, organizations or groups who may be working in a state or a region who are not the healthcare providers themselves, but are trying to facilitate healthcare providers getting involved in a um, perinatal telehealth project. What sort of advice would you give those? Sorry, I don't understand that question. Can you 
you state that again? Sure. So organizations who are not healthcare providers themselves that are, are trying to, um, I guess, convince, maybe a word, healthcare providers uh -huh. to get involved in a system of care like this. What sort of advice would you give those folks? Well, I mean, I would look at national resources around, yeah, well, we, we've helped a lot of people over the years by setting examples and talking to groups, and we're still willing to do that. Um, um, I, I think that um, if you can convince them, I, I mean, it often gets down to money. So if you can convince them that it's, you know, ultimately about money, then, you know, it can be done. You know, we negotiated the contract with Medicaid to pay for this stuff. So we never, we never lost money. And in fact, it, it makes money for the university. So if you can convince them that they decrease, you know, if doctors are, are traveling, it, that wastes money. If, if you could increase the referral network, then that increases money. And not to mention it saves people's lives, you know, ultimately beyond that. So I, I mean, I would, I mean, I would think about it in terms of, of profitability in some way. And the other thing is that if you don't do it, you know, maybe UMS will do it or maybe Teladoc will do it anyway. I mean, there, there are companies getting into, you know, OB as well. It's not just happening to family medicine, it's happening to everybody. So you better get with the program or you'll be left behind. All right, another question is, what role do um, other types of providers, such as nurses, midwives, and other providers have in your program? Well, maybe Ross can talk about that, but we have guidelines that are, we built guidelines many years back. There, you can go to our site and look at these guidelines, and with the idea that, that you would use these guidelines and let everybody practice at the upper level of their license, that was the idea about it. And so, uh, Roz, you want to talk about that? Yeah, uh, some of the other providers that work in our group, on our team, uh, are genetic, we have genetic counselors, we have diabetic educators, uh, nurse practitioners, like uh, Dr. Lowry said, the system approach. So, he has the highest intellectual property. We need to do everything we can do and use that property and bring him in as needed, you know, as absolutely necessary. So uh, we have a uh, psychiatrist on our team also, um, you name it, and you can add them in there. We, uh, we have a uh, neurologist, which are, was not really with the OB team, but yeah, just a big team of us, uh, educators, uh, nutritionists, um, nurse practitioner. So whatever you use, say in a hospital setting or in your clinic, you can do the same thing over telemedicine and people beam in and do what they need to do for that patient. Great. Thank you. Um, and can you talk a little bit more about the, the remote monitoring that you mentioned with the new FCC money and what are some of your plans for rolling that out? Yeah, well, the, the idea, again, is that um, um, if you can keep patients away from the doctors and away from the hospital, that would be a good thing. And OB, that, you know, we had such a track record with OB, we focus on that. So like blood pressure devices and scales and dipsticks, mm -hmm. and then you can get your doctor visit with the, with the provider, and then you don't have to go to the doctor's office. You know, so that's, you know, the, the concept. We also ha are experimenting with, with uh, fetal monitors that we're making available um, that could, you know, detect fetal heartbeat in an automated way. There are some devices coming on the market now that are idiot proof so that um, it doesn't, doesn't it's, not like a, it's not like a Doppler, which, you know, Doppler you have to be trained to kind of use and they're relatively expensive. You know, anyway, so that's the idea is that, I mean, we don't have enough to provide the whole state of Arkansas, but again, you know, pregnant women are not sick. And when, you know, the virus is back and it's bad. And so it, it's almost like, you know, when you have measles outbreaks, you don't want to bring pregnant women to your doctor's office 
so they'll get the measles. So it's not so much, um, I mean, they're coming into threat and by keeping them out of the office, that would be a good thing to do, but they still need to have their blood pressure checked and all that. Now, you, you, in other areas like congestive heart failure and other diseases, it's even more important to do this. You know, so, I mean, look for this to evolve. As devices get cheaper and cheaper, you can do a lot more with it. We're, we have put together a data warehouse that um, would take data feeds from patients, and then you set alerts, and the alerts in the data warehouse tell a nurse that, that Miss Jones gained five pounds of weight and that and then somebody calls Miss Jones up or does a video consult with her and tells her to take 80 milligrams of Lasix. So technology allows you to create more real-time feedback loops for which you do in interventions to change outcome sooner by having a you're building again an expert system like I said before. Great. Um, and another question, so I think this is specific for um, looking at sort of platform, software, and technical equipment. Do you recommend for a telemedicine initiative? And I think specifically for prenatal care. Um, and have you had any issues with HIPAA compliance? Well, uh, the, 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 the system that we built many years back used T1 lines and they're, they're high bandwidth, nailed up secure lines. Um, and we still use that for ultrasounds around the, the hospitals because you need high bandwidth, you know, because we look at live streaming like I showed on the video before, that's actually live streaming. As we begin to do, um, as we're doing prenatal visits, you don't need as much bandwidth. So there you can use cell phones and iPads and computers for that. You, you just have to get a HIPAA compliant, you know, platform for that kind of work. The HIPAA compliant platform scrambles the data in a secure encrypted way. So I could not intercept the interaction and decode it, you know, and, and look at, you know, you know, Miss Jones's breasts. We do uh, we do breastfeeding stuff. So right now, people around the nation are using you know Skype and and whatever they want to, and that that's not going to be allowed eventually. So you need to find a HIPAA compliant platform, and there are literally dozens of them around right now. We use a platform called Visual, which we evaluated, and it was a cheap cheaper to do and it was more in line with what we wanted to do also we're using we're we can bring students in and they don't charge us to allow students to participate in this so there are a lot of issues um, with what you choose that you got to consider so you know I, there's not one size fits all for this i think you have to define what you're going to use it for and then try to pick something that works and i would not I would not just say with a national company like American Oil or something like that, take care of me. I don't know what to do because you'll, you'll, you'll pay a lot of money for something that may not work as well. Great. You need to look at independent resources to help you make these decisions. Great. Um, and are, as a follow-up to that, I know some of the telehealth resource centers have some of that sort of yes, evaluation yes. too. So that's a great resource. Yes. Um, so this is probably our last question. We just have a couple of minutes. Um, can you speak to the use of telemedicine for care and management of high-risk pregnant people, specifically high-risk medical, high medical risk for things such as preterm labor, hypertension, et cetera? Yeah, well, um, in that case, we, we've been doing that for a long, long time. That's really how we started. And we, uh, starting out, we used mainly hospitals or high resource centers like that. And we would have the patients go to visit the hospital. You know, a lot, a lot of these were done in, in ultrasound units in, in hospitals. And we'd have a nurse there and they'd take their blood pressure and we'd do follow-up visits there, like RHI immunization, we do, you know, head dopplers there, 
you know, we, we'd see the patients rather than bring them all the way to Little Rock. And if we needed to bring them down, we'd of course bring them down. Often they would not deliver at the university. Um, we, we also created a, uh, we have a, bur a, uh, a hotel, you know, um, uh, in which we put women that are in preterm labor or um, not so much high, bad hypertension, but if they have transportation problems and live far away, they can stay in this hotel for free and then they can get clinic visits and if they go into labor, they can um, be you know, admitted to labor and delivery. That freed up space on our labor and delivery unit you know, for patients that were more acute. So we've been doing that for how long, Rosalind? Maybe 20 years we've been doing that? Yeah, it's been a long time. Since 20 since years. The bigger beginning. <laughs> and we have maybe five to, five to eight patients in that hotel all the time um, for many, many years. Um, so we, we, we use a very blended approach with this. We try to keep them at home if we can and do the visits peripherally, but, and that saves a lot of time and effort for transporting patients. Um, Great. And we can't tell any difference in outcome. We, we've done a study on ultrasound mm -hmm. and the ultrasound is the same over telemedicine as it is live. No, no difference in failure rates. It's about the same. It's St not statistically different. Great. Um, well, thank you all so much for being here with us today and for sharing your knowledge and your experiences. I think it's been really helpful for folks to hear about um, your experience in Arkansas. Um, I want to just share with folks as we wrap up, um, I'm just checking the time here, some questions for reflection. I invite you to take a picture of this if you'd like. Um, this is something the Maternal Health Learning and Innovation Center um, will be attempting to do for, for all of our upcoming webinars, just kind of give some folks some questions to think about um, for your own reflection as you kind of move forward and talk with your teams about this information. Um, 